Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be a two-parter. This is part one, and this is based on an exhibit Steve Rowe and I did last year at RSNA. It didn't win any awards, and we were robbed, but we published about 18 papers from this exhibit, so it was pretty, pretty good. Anyway, cinematic rendering is sort of the latest and greatest way of doing 3D imaging, and you've probably seen a lot of the pictures we've had on CTSS, as well as on uh, CTSS Facebook, as well as CTSS Instagram, as well as CTSS Twitter. You get my point. Very impressive images. We also had images on the cover of Radiology last month and in July. Uh, Dave Blumke has a new uh, picture of the front page, so it's an article that goes with it. And then there was another article on cinematic rendering by Fritz, Jan Fritz, on MSK cinematic rendering. So it's not just a CT process. But I thought I would share with you just some of the basic things that were done. And it's amazing when I go through this talk, which was a, something we finished early December, let's say, and now we're f going forward seven months, how much more we've done. But I thought this would be a good review. And since many people don't have cinematic rendering, but people are interested, I thought I would share this with you. So what cinematic rendering is, is a form of volume visualization. It's a form of volume rendering, but it creates more photorealistic uh, rendering because it does a better job of dealing with uh, surface detail by enhancing surface detail with shadows and realistic uh, shadowing effects. Both the uh, classic volume rendering and cinematic rendering make use of thin section CT, so the acquisitions are the same. You can think about 0.75 by 0.5 millimeters, our typical rendering parameters. We do nothing special in terms of acquisition for cinematic rendering, just good quality CT data sets. And we don't do any additional radiation. That sometimes people say the images are so good, you must be giving a lot of dose. It's just the standard dose we do for routine CT. Just like with classic volume rendering, each voxel is assigned to color and translucency based on its density and its tissues. However, uh, the differences in the technique arise from the lighting models used. Volume rendering makes use of ray casting, which was very innovative when they first did it at Pixar in the mid-80s. A single ray of light passing through the volume produces a pixel that is a sum total of the colors and translucencies of the voxels through which it is passed. Okay, that's straightforward. But what cinematic rendering does is it uses more of a global lighting model that creates effects including realistic shadowing, appropriate obscuration of the light source depending on the relationship of the light source with the image and the volume. And in fact, we're using it now with these multiple light sources, but it's still not optimized. So everything I'll show you is, um, I think, really amazing images, but it's only part of what you're going to see in the future as the lighting model gets stronger and as we're able to create better images. Now, in terms of clinical utility, we've published, I think, 15 articles. We've showed uh, in certain specific applications from aneurysms and the like and pancreatic cancer and different tumors, but I think it's so new there are no large series that we're working on them. So a lot of what you're going to see is going to be data, but it's going to be images to let you make up your own mind, knowing that the data takes a little bit of time to follow up. Uh, also, you think about it, imaging like this would really be, it really is incredible. The surgeons love it for preoperative planning. You can imagine this as a way of doing uh, education, particularly in complex structures. And it's also a way of showing patients information in a way that they can better understand. So in a sense, you really cover all bases from diagnosis, diagnosis to uh, therapy, to education, to patient communication. So in this exhibit, we had a limited number of slides. We focused on normal anatomy, oncology, MSK imaging, and vascular cases. And what we'll try to do is in each of the cases, or almost all of the cases, show you not only the cinematic rendering, but show you really good volume and MIP imaging. And it's important to remember that we did not spend time trying to make the cinematic rendering look better than the other techniques by giving crappy images for the other techniques. We do everything only as good as we could do it. So the cinematic is, is state-of-the-art, the volume rendering is state-of-the-art, and the MIP and even the 2D is state-of-the-art. So we look at normal anatomy. Here's just uh, take a look at the skull, images on top of classic volume rendering, good shadowing, uh, more realistic uh, shadowing, better detail. Look at the um, 
mandible, the coracoid process, look at the orbits, look at the details of the bony structure. It really looks like a um, holding a skull in your hand, the cinematic renderings. Or in this example, the cinematic rendering where we change the parameters, being able to show you both the vascular map as well as the brain and soft tissues, showing you both the uh, carotids, intracranial circulation, and then the brain matter itself. Here with cinematic, you can see the details you can get in the skull base. You also can see the details as we look at the carotid arteries, as we bring the soft tissues into play, as we show you the mandible, the teeth, base of the skull. And then you could create infinite number of views. So here's a view where the patient's head is tilted back. I mean, we tilted for the patient, of course. But you can see nicely the carotids, the common and internal external carotid arteries. You can see how I can accentuate soft tissue. You can see also the mandible and the angle of the mandible, the zygomatic arches. Um, as with any 3D technique, is the interactivity. So one of the things with cinematic rendering, it's not a plug and play. You need to do some work. We've developed presets, which make that work a lot easier. But still, it takes some experience. And like everything, it's a learning process. So here is just a good set of images with cinematic rendering as I go from the muscle to transparency through the muscle and showing and optimizing the vessels and then showing bone. So like classic volume rendering, we're able to look and optimize. And here I go from the vessel and muscle to vessels with bone gone to vessels only. So the ability to simply change the data set and optimize for the specific problem at hand is something that's easy to do. And here's just another set of images, again, giving you a feel of the uh, 3D mapping with the cinematic rendering and the importance of the lighting model in showing you both bone, soft tissue, and vessels. You can see in these images uh, of the neck, look at the detail of the sternocleidomastoid. mastoid, look at the vessels, look at the mandible. Here I'll change it from soft tissue to bone. Look at the detail, the orientation of the mandible on the right with the carotid vessels when we take away all of the muscle. It's the same exact image, it's just simply we've taken away the muscle and a lot of the venous structures. And here again, uh, detailed anatomy of the head and neck soft tissue with rendering, optimizing the vessels coming off the arch and the detail involved. Or here showing you the submandibular glands in red, uh, as well as the sternocleidomastoid muscles, as well as the mandible. Again, the detail is unprecedented, I think, in terms of looking at soft tissue vessel and many of this anatomy. We can also accentuate tissues by changing parameters. So here, look at the stomach and the gastric folds. Image on your left shows cinematic rendering, which is just simply showing the fluid in the stomach. And then I take the fluid away and look at that fold pattern. Just very impressive. Now, when we look at clinical applications, classic things, cranial facial, large destructive squamous cell carcinoma, bone destruction, orbital destruction. Um, again, you can see the defect from the muscle to the soft tissue to bone to this large squamous cell carcinoma invading the calvarium which is seen from the axial and coronal images but you can see the extent of the tumor on the patient uh, very good visualization of a very very bad disease but again whether you're isolating and showing the bony destruction or you're showing the solid soft tissue mass or you're showing the skin Again, the detail of cinematic rendering and compare it to the volume rendering shows some of the key advantages. Or in this case, where the patient has a osteoma of the posterior calvarium, very nice shadowing. Look at the detail of shadowing with cinematic rendering. You're able to really get that mass to stand out away from the uh, skull. Here's an example with a large cystic pancreatic mass, which was a serous cyst adenoma. You see the axials, you see the uh, coronal MIP, and then you see two cinematic renderings where we can accentuate how the lesions are low density, the relationship to arterial and venous structures, or in this case with a pancreatic lipoma, somewhat obvious incidental finding on the arterial and uh, uh, axial and coronal views. And then look at the scallop nature of the lesion on the uh, 
cinematic rendering. Again, it's just, it's fat density, so you're seeing the wall of the duodenum is simply projecting through. Just a very nice example. Look at also the detail of bowel and kidneys. Or in this case of an infiltrating adenocarcinoma, shown nicely on axial and coronal views, you can see the detail of the patient's tumor with vascular invasion seen on these images. You see the textural changes in the mass. We can really look at texture changes for picking up early pancreatic tumors. Or in this example where you can see from the coronal views, uh, both a regular coronal and then a MIP, you can see the destruction of the uh, peripancreatic region where the tumor encases and includes the portal vein, splenic vein, SMV junction. And those same images with cinematic rendering, you nicely see the infiltrating tumor in the head of pancreas, as well as the extensive collateral flow because of the portal vein, splenic vein, SMV junction involvement. So just a very nice example of even a simple case. Or in this case where the patient has a low density mass in the body of pancreas, one of the things we're finding out is with cinematic rendering, we can accentuate the detection of subtle textural changes and perhaps pick up smaller tumors. If you look at the two sets of images, you can see how I'm able to really accentuate the patient's pancreatic mass, see the normal gland, see the atrophic distal gland, and the dilated duct. The goal, of course, is early detection of pancreatic cancer and not to miss any lesion. When lesions are vascular, so here's a large mass, head of pancreas, very vascular, neuroendocrine tumor, you can see it's splaying the patient's um, hepatic artery, but narrowing it, but not narrowing it. And then look at it with a cinematic rendering. Look at the detail of the vascularity, the texture of that. Look at the detail on the arterial side and the detail on the venous side, the 3D relationships of the various structures are particularly nicely seen with the cinematic rendering, as in this example. Or in this case, where the patient has a gist tumor, axial images, very large tumor, extensive neovascularity, multiple collaterals, central necrosis, extensive neovascularity on the axial or MIP reconstruction views. And then we take it to cinematic. Look how nicely you can see all the collaterals, the tumor necrosis, the display of the vessels, orientation of vessels, and the extent of necrosis. And so for large tumors, these vascular maps can be very helpful for uh, surgical planning as well as chemoembolization and any other factor where you need the relationship of the tumor to the vessels. Renal cell carcinoma, you can see the textural change in the mass in the lower pulverized kidney, a carcinoma. Again, one of the things we're looking at is can you do difference in textures between chromophobes and clear cells and papillaries? You know, can we distinguish? One of the problems with, with the kidneys is 25% of patients who go to surgery for renal mass have a benign process. And perhaps this will be one way of analyzing the lesions to make the information better. Uh, when the patient does have very obvious tumor, as in this case with neovascularity, uh, the preoperative planning very nicely shows the vessels feeding the neovascularity, the extent of neovascularity, and its involvement. Or in this case, where we picked up a 5-millimeter renal lesion, which a little bit better shown on the cinematic, uh, where you can really see that lesion coming off being like a dimple on the renal surface, and from the axials, you can see the lesion is vascular. And this was a small renal cell carcinoma. Very easy to walk by, but very nicely shown on these images. Or in this case, you can see an infiltrating tumor with extensive nodes by the right kidney, stretching of the renal artery, very nicely showing you the renal artery and the cinematic that's infiltrated by tumor. You can see where tumor begins and ends, where the textural changes are. Uh, or in this example of a patient with a transitional cell carcinoma, patient in hematuria, you see the subtle lesion left renal pelvis, best seen on late phase imaging, but also seen in the arterial phase as a soft tissue mass. And here is that same lesion on the 3D imaging, particularly on the targeted images on the right, you can see the soft tissue sitting in the renal pelvis and just near the lower pole collecting systems. So that becomes very, very important obviously in terms of uh, classification and distinguishing between the various renal types of tumor. Or in this example where you can see that filling defect in the patient's 
a lower pole calyx left kidney. Just a very nice visualization. And finally, here's another case. Nothing very subtle, mass left renal pelvis, very nicely seen. You can see particularly on the MIP, uh, coronal view, delayed phase, the distortion of the renal pelvis with destruction of the renal pelvis, the calyceal changes, and just a very nice example of a transitional cell. And here it is when I look at the uh, patient's cinematic rendering. Now you can see that soft tissue mass filling in the renal pelvis, the destruction of the calyces, the distortion of the renal pelvis on the image on the far right. So just a very nice set of images showing you the uh, transitional cell carcinoma. And then as we get to liver, here's a nice example of a patient with colorectal metastasis to the liver. Again, the texture of the normal liver is seen on the cinematic, and then you see the lower pole uh, or the lower portion of tumor. Now, in oncology across the board, we can indeed be very helpful. So here's an example of a renal cell carcinoma in a patient who has bilateral adrenal metastasis. Again, notice the vascularity of the lesions uh, in the adrenal glands, but then look at the changes with cinematic rendering, nicely shown. Or in this case, the desmoplastic reaction, right lower quadrant in a patient with a carcinoid tumor. Again, you could appreciate from this case, and we're about to publish a paper on this, looking at the small bowel, looking at the mesentery, looking for nodes or tumors, as in this example of carcinoid tumor, and then the relationship of the tumor to the various vessels. Or in this case, with an enhancing lesion, the duodenum, you're thinking carcinoid, you're thinking just tumor. Uh, you might even think about, could this be a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas growing onto that region? And then here you see it very nicely, the textural changes, the epicenter of the lesion being in the duodenum, and this was a gist tumor. So I think one of the things we need to learn are the tissue textures of the various tumor types. And perhaps simply on that, we can distinguish carcinoid from adenocarcinoma, from gist tumor, from metastasis. So there's a lot we need to think about. Or here, this patient with small bowel obstruction, you see the transition right lower quadrant, you see it very nicely on the coronals and on the volume rendering and on the cinematic, very nicely shown. Cinematic shows both the mass as well as the transition point, and it's all very nicely shown in this regard. Now, there are other things we can look at, and there are a number of different tumors. So I see the clock, and we're halfway through the talk. Why don't we stop here, and then we'll pick up in, let's say, five minutes. Okay, be right back.